During the War of the Roses, women played a key role to help the respective sides to stay in power. One of the most important women was Margaret of Anjou. Queen Margaret was thrown into a chaotic and delicate political situation. She fiercely fought in the name of her husband and her son. Her arrival at court could have not been more unfortunate, as the boiling point of the War of the Roses was arriving, cousin against cousin, the Lancastrians and Yorks were ready to shed blood for the throne of England. This is The Ladies of the Roses. Episode 1 Margaret of Anjou, the She-Wolf of France What were the Wars of the Roses exactly, and why are they so important? The War of the Roses were a series of civil wars fought for the crown of England. Amongst the noticeable personalities were Richard III, who lost to a certain man known as Henry Tudor. These wars are still being studied due to their cultural and political effect it had on the country. Despite some academics doubting its big impact, we can point to some significant effects the war had on the country, particularly with the diminishing political relevance of the House of Neville and the House of Plantagenet finding itself extinguished. But we can point to its most significant impact, and that was who ended up winning. Spoiler, it was neither the Yorks nor the Lancastrians, it was the House of Tudor. To understand the War of the Roses, we have to go back in time before it even happened. The House of Plantagenet would have had its roots in Anjou, France, and they had such accomplishments as being forced to sign the Magna Carta, which ensured the monarch wasn't an absolute monarch, amongst other things. A rumor goes around that the name Plantagenet comes from the flower Plantagenist, which was a flower that Richard, Duke of York, used in his hat. But take that with a grain of salt, right? Everything started with Edward III, a king who ruled from 1327 to 1377. He had five sons, Edward the Black Prince, Lionel of Antwerp, John of Gaunt, Edmund of Langley, and Thomas Woodstock. King Edward created various duchies for his kids, the Duchy of Cornwall for Edward, the Duchy of Clarence and Lancaster for Lionel and John, and the Duchy of York and Gloucester for Edmund and Thomas, respectively. In theory, this looks like a king trying to provide for his sons and expand his wealth and control. But this created an issue. A powerful class of English nobility who all had claims to the throne and enough power to fight for it. They had divided themselves into two sides, the Lancastrians who took as their emblem the Red Rose versus the Yorks who took as their emblem the White Rose. The House of Lancaster was composed of the descendants of John of Gaunt. They received preference from Edward III, and it was founded by Edmund Crouchbark, the first Earl of Lancaster and Leicester. It had two cadet branches, and those were the House of Beaufort and the House of Somerset. Keep that in mind, it's important. The House of York descended from Edmund of Langley, and it is believed that he had a superior claim to the throne compared to the House of Lancaster according to the cognatic primogeniture, but an inferior claim according to the agnatic primogeniture. Some historians say the death of Edward III in 1377 marked the beginning of the War of the Roses, and not so much militaristically, but more so it planted the seeds of it. His two oldest sons, Edward the Black Prince and Lionel Duke of Clarence, had already died. The Black Prince's son, Richard, had a claim to the throne because he was the son of the eldest son of the king. But he was a kid without siblings, and he had three living uncles. However, he was crowned king at age 10. His reign was marked by such accomplishments as regency councils and the influence of John of Gaunt and Thomas Woodstock. Then, the 100 Years' War happened, and then the Peasants' Revolt happened. He was not a popular guy. He was succeeded by Henry IV, the son of John of Gaunt, who then was succeeded by Henry V. This Henry revived old dynastic claims to the throne of France. His decisive victory at the Battle of Agincourt, amongst other things, legitimized even more the Lancastrian monarchy. 
Henry V and Charles VI of France signed the Treaty of Troy, and to seal it, Henry married Catherine of Valois. This was portrayed in the Netflix movie The King, with Timothée Chalamet portraying Henry and Lily Rose Deft portraying Catherine of Valois. As Edward, the second Duke of York, had died, Henry V permitted Richard of York to inherit his father's lands. For the purpose of this video, I will be referring to Richard as York. On August 31st, the mighty Henry V died at 36, leaving the crown to his nine-month-old son Henry VI. Henry's brothers didn't have any heirs, so if something were to happen to the new king, the House of Beaufort would be the successor to the House of Lancaster. Keep that in mind, it's important. Henry's mother Catherine was still young and could remarry, and this was a source of contention with her brother-in-law Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, who was also the guardian of her son. Parliament then passed a bill that said if she remarried without the king's consent, her husband would forfeit any lands or possessions. And if she wanted to marry, she would have to wait for her son to be of age, and by this point, Henry was only six years old. There were rumors that she wanted to marry Edmund Beaufort, but these rumors are to be taken with a grain of salt. She, however, laid eyes on a handsome Welsh man by the name of Owen. It is believed that he was a squire and she gave him a post in her household. Some sources say that he was in charge of her wardrobe, while others say he was a butler. The relationship turned sexual and romantic, and Catherine became pregnant with their first child. Their children were carried their father's surname, Tudor. The evidence of a marriage between them is murky, and historians agree they most likely lived together as man and wife but were not legally married. Although a medieval marriage that was consumed was legally binding, you get the point, you get the point. There was no celebration and the children were raised outside of court. However, these half-siblings of the king would all have various degrees of influence over King Henry VI, with Henry VI actually granting his half-siblings the custody of the wealthy heiress Margaret Beaufort. Henry came to majority at age 16. His entire reign was run by diverse politicians and councils. He had little interest in warfare, something that I am sure was raising everybody's blood pressure. But he had a keen interest in the spiritual and the academic. By his 20s, the Earl of Suffolk, William de la Pole, who, who I will be referring to as Suffolk, began looking for an appropriate bride for the shy Henry, who was regarded as naive and even childlike. As Henry was a fan of peace, they sought to look for an alliance with France. Sources say Margaret was born on the 23rd of March, 1430, in Lorraine, at a time a fief of the Holy Roman Empire and ruled by the House of Valois Anjou. She was the daughter of René, King of Naples, and Isabella, Duchess of Lorraine, making her a powerful contestant in the ever more competitive marriage market of European nobility. Margaret was not alone, though. She had five brothers and four sisters, and three half-brothers from her father's extramarital activities. Despite her father being the King of Naples, he was known as a man of many crowns but no kingdoms. Because he was the Duke of Anjou and only King of Naples, Sicily, and Jerusalem by titles, he had an established titles thing going on if you catch my drift. She grew up at a castle in Tarascon near Naples in the Kingdom of Sicily. Her mother took a very active role in her education, and it is believed that she was a pupil of Antoine de la Salle, who also taught her brothers. Margaret grew up around powerful women. Her mother fought wars on behalf of her husband while he was imprisoned by the Duke of Burgundy, and she ruled the Duchy of Lorraine in her own right. Her grandmother, Jolanda de Aragon, duchy the Duchy of Anjou as a regent for her son while Margaret was a child. Jolanda repelled the English military, and it is believed these maneuvers by the woman in her family became the blueprint for her later actions as regent for her husband. It is also believed her rich education and innate interest in lectures also contributed to getting along so well with her husband. 
although Margaret also enjoyed French romances and hunting, and she was given the nickname La Petite Creature. When it came to marriage, several options were carefully considered. Some of these men were Emperor Frederick II, the son of the future Duke of Burgundy, and Charles, Count of Nevers. But, by 1439, France and England began talks to arrange a marriage between Henry VI and Margaret. Margaret was sent to the French court, where her aunt, Queen Marie, lived. There, she learned the ropes of how to be a queen and was regarded as a great beauty with a fierce character and a long list of accomplishments. On May 4, 1444, she met with the English to discuss marriage arrangements to Henry VI of England of the Lancastrian side of the War of the Roses. Despite mixed opinions on the match, some thought this was a genuine attempt at a peace with France. On the 22nd of May, a treaty of truce was signed, guaranteeing peace for two years. Her betrothal to Henry was celebrated at the Church of St. Martin in Tours. It was a raucous affair indeed, with a long and important list of attendants. The King and Queen of France, the respective Dauphin and Dauphine, the Dukes of Calabria, Brittany, the Count of St. Paul and Vendôme, and the Count of Maine. After that ceremony, eight days of celebration followed hosted by the King Charles VII and his mistress, the iconic Agnes Sorel. This luxurious treatment did not extend to her dowry though, which was meager. Of course, the truce was included, but it also included an empty claim to the Kingdom of Mallorca on her mother's side, 20,000 francs, and Margaret renouncing to her father's possessions. Her expensive expedition to bring Margaret to England costed 50,000 pounds, and this outraged the English people. On March 15, 1445, she entered Paris and was welcomed at the Notre Dame Cathedral. Her brother delivered her to the Duke of Suffolk, and her father cried so much when he said goodbye that it was hard for him to speak. It was an overwhelming celebration between the ecstatic feelings of a girl who will now become a queen and the bittersweet emotions of knowing they would never see each other again. Richard, Duke of York, welcomed her on behalf of her, f of her future husband. He received her with a palfrey, caparison with crimson gold and velvet embroidered with gold roses. This was the welcome gift of her future husband. York and Margaret went to Rouen, where she was York guest during two state dinners, and they seemed to get along well, spending the evening among cordial conversations and hoping their future encounters were just as pleasant. It was obvious that Margaret was short on funds, though, having to pawn a plate to the Duchess of Suffolk to pay her sailors. Still, the trip continued through Normandy where Margaret was exhausted after the ship was caught in a storm. When they arrived at Porchester on April 9, she was so tired she fainted in a cottage. Henry visited her in disguise, dressed as a squire to deliver a letter he had written himself. Margaret dismissed him without acknowledging him, and it is believed that she didn't even know who he was. When she reached London, the mob was such the kingdom had to make inspections on the roofs and balconies as spectators would sit and stand on them to see her pass by. This ceremony progress lasted two days, and she spent the night at the Tower of London, accompanied by eight theatrical pageants concerning peace with France, casting Margaret as a symbol of peace between the countries and a redeemer and intercessor. It is unclear if these pageants were government propaganda or if they reflected popular sentiment. Between April 21 or April 23, she married King Henry VI of England at Titchfield Abbey in Hampshire. She was 15 and he was 23. It was a private ceremony officiated by the Bishop of Salisbury. Margaret caught a striking figure in a white satin dress with silver and golden daisies. A month later, on the 30th of May, she was crowned Queen of England at Westminster Abbey. This was an expensive ceremony. Some historians place the cost of more than 5,000 pounds. In 2017, according to the National Archives of the UK, this would have been approximately 3 million pounds. Henry loved her very much. He renovated her apartments before her arrival and gifted her various horses. 
After the coronation, René of Anjou entered negotiations with England for a lifetime alliance and a 20-year truce in exchange for the territory of Maine to Anjou. Throughout all of this, Margaret and Henry corresponded with King Charles VII and acted as mediators, hinting at her political cleverness. The loss of Maine was regarded as a betrayal, and Margaret, like foreign consorts, became the one to blame. However, William de la Pole, Duke of Suffolk, received a great deal of blame as well, and even more than Margaret. This did not dampen the marriage between her and Henry. They spent time together by choice and both enjoyed education and culture. But this did not extend to the bedroom, you'll see. Margaret and Henry had issues in the bedchamber, and it is believed that it was because the king did not know how the mechanics of sex really worked, and it is believed they needed help from bedroom coaches. However, they like each other, and they really enjoyed each other's company. In 1448, she was granted the license to found Queen's College, Cambridge, and he founded King's College. But just a year earlier, in 1447, Margaret and Henry had summoned the Duke of Gloucester on acts of treason. Margaret had no sympathy for acts of unloyalty, and these allegations were brought to her and Henry by the Earl of Suffolk and Cardinal Beaufort. Gloucester was put in custody in Bury St. Edmunds, where he died probably of a heart attack, although some people say it was poisoning, before he could be tried. Surviving letters of Margaret show acts of mediation, intercession and interventions, such as the arranging of marriages, the collection of alms, and the return of stolen property. She was well known for being able to administrate her household and she was generous to servants and gave plenty to charities. She took an interest in England's wool trade and imported silk craftsmen from Lyon and Flanders. Also introducing silk weaving and becoming the patron of the Sisterhood of Silkwomen. Margaret also financed the building of English merchant ships which sailed to the Mediterranean. But not all of these acts had happy endings and there is evidence that she recommended a man named Alexander Manning as a jailer at Newgate but he turned the prisoners loose in an act of protest and then he was jailed himself. There were also complaints against her for her lack of a male heir. Although we already talked about this could be more on Henry's side, as he was starting to show signs of mental illness. This, alongside his uninterest in warfare, made her position in the court precarious. She began noticing that her peaceful Henry had a tragic side. He was indecisive, weak, and his mental illness was starting to become more evident. This opened the door for other noblemen and lords to fight for control of the king. Compiled with the government overspending and rampant corruption, it's not really hard to see how she probably felt like she was on shaky ground. Being a foreign queen breeds a lot of distrust among the people and the nobles, just as Marie Antoinette did. Foreign brides were trained to do acts of benefit for their own foreign families. Margaret's situation was no different, and the loss of, of Maine, amongst other things, was proof for many. Problems were piling up for her. She didn't have an heir, her husband was already regarded as an unpopular king, and the corruption was running rampant, and people were tired of this. They wished for a stronger king, one that could rule England with an iron fist of chivalry and authority. Henry VI was not that guy, and Margaret was perceived as a conniving snake who took advantage of his naivete and mental decline. But Henry wasn't so innocent. Nobles despised him second by second, convinced that he was foolish, shallow, and stupid, and they prayed for a stronger man to lead the country and crush their enemies. On the other hand, there were nobles who wanted Henry there, as his foolishness could be exploited for their own personal benefit. As long as he was kept distracted and fed, they could rule the country as they wished. By 1449, Somerset was leading a campaign in France, reopening hostilities in Normandy despite being one of the main advocates for peace before. And by 1450, the French took the province King Henry V of England had fought hard for. As if this was not bad enough, William de la Pole, 
the man Margaret had held as a friend and trusted ally was killed in the English Channel after being intercepted. He had a messy fall of grace after allegations of an English attack in Normandy. Parliament accused him of bad administration and the King and Margaret tried to protect him at all costs, but to no avail. His death marked the beginning of the end for Margaret, or so her enemies thought. But what they did not know is that Margaret was very much her mother's daughter. That same year, a man named Jack Cade led a rebellion in Kent. He called himself John Mortimer, and the rebellion was bloody and took the lives of many innocents. Kaufman says it was the biggest rebellion the country had seen, apart from the Cornish Rebellion of 1497. The rebels led by Jay Cade, aka John Mortimer, sacked London. Although some sources say he was trying to get them to be an organized front, they wanted to execute all men who they blamed for the corruption of the country. Any monarch would have squashed the rebels by any means necessary, but Henry sadly was not that man. He sent a small army to quell the rebels, but they were crushed once they reached Seven Oaks. The rebels killed the unpopular Bishop of Salisbury, who happened to be the king's confessor. Once they reached the city gates, the king gave them James Fiennes, the first Baron Say, the high treasurer who was brought for a mock trial and beheaded on the charges of treason and conspiracy. Due to Cade not being able to maintain his troops in order, the rebellion achieved nothing and London was retaken. However, this rebellion showed the feelings of discontent against the crown and the lords. Henry had run away to the Midlands, but 20-year-old Margaret stayed behind. She acts quickly to calm the rebels and promises to pardon them if they speak up. This seems to work and by the time Henry returns, the rebels who hadn't accepted the queen's pardon were rounded and presented to the king. In front of Henry, she orders the execution of the rebels, showing no mercy for traitors and the type of decisiveness and attitude expected from a king. Margaret's reputation for ruthlessness was taking shape, and she saw it as her job to step up if her husband wasn't going to. The problem was, Margaret was not the only person thinking that way. She had befriended another politician, Edmund Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, who I will be referring to as Somerset. As she ran the country behind the throne, another man thought he could do a better job than the Queen her old friend Richard, Duke of York. Richard was an imposing man. He was the king's cousin and heir to the throne as Margaret and Henry still had no children. He was a seasoned military leader. He was ruling Ireland for the king after all. But what the hell was he doing in England? His supporters and friends asked him to return and put an order as the bad government was making everybody fight amongst each other. York and his supporters were convinced that he was the right man for the job. He had the military expertise, plenty of children, and he seems to have his head on his shoulders, unlike the king. So by 4050, he raised an army and meets the king at Westminster Palace to straighten things up. Like an absolute chad, he told the king he needed to fire all of his advisors and ordered the arrest of Somerset and asked to appoint himself in charge of the country as Lord Protector. Parliament told him absolutely fucking not and that the king had already given that job to Somerset 16 days ago, who had lost an important city in France and had the audacity to run away, the same Somerset Margaret favored. To York, Somerset was the cause of the problems and he was the savior and solution. York saw this as a betrayal and thought of Somerset as a Judas. However, Margaret was not blind to Somerset's fault. She knew they were there, but as a woman and consort, she could not rule on her own. He was her proxy. As historian Dan Jones put it, quote, whether York knows it or not, by attacking Somerset, he was attacking the queen, end quote. York begins gathering troops and demands Somerset to be put on trial. And initially, Henry agrees. He wants absolutely no conflict with a man who he knows could tear him apart. However, when he goes to speak in person with the king, he finds Somerset in the tent and realizes it was a trap. 
Jork is brought to the Cathedral of St. Paul and forced to kneel in front of the king and swear an oath of allegiance. You may ask, who did this? Well, Margaret, of course. She pulled the right strings and was able to prevent the arrest of her friend. Margaret had won this battle. Those who opposed her probably groaned and rolled their eyes when it was announced she was expecting a child, something that she had been struggling with. Margaret probably felt like she was catching a break, but sadly, things would not stay like that for much longer. In August 1453, Henry was hunting with some friends when a correspondent arrives with hunting news. Gascony, the last territory England had in France, had been lost in the Battle of Castilian. For a time, the Plantagenet dynasty had dominated more territory in France than the French themselves, and all of that had been lost. Henry suffered a massive mental breakdown, collapsing into a catatonic state. Theories had been proposed as to what happened to him, but the most popular of them being that he had catatonic schizophrenia. Documents tell us that he was in a trance-like state, unresponsive and catatonic. He had lost his speech, and he could not react to the world around him. Not even to the birth of his heir, the desired male heir, Prince Edward. Margaret and the Duke of Buckingham presented the infant to Henry, but he was not able to acknowledge the child. This left Margaret in a precarious position. Lord Somerset could only do so much. The king was catatonic and she was without a husband and without a political ally. The power vacuum was chaotic, but Margaret is king in all but name. She has a son after all and having a male heir still gave her a fair amount of power. She names Somerset as her son's godfather and gets him to sideline the Duke of York. However, this doesn't work. The Duke of York get his supporters, including the powerful Earl of Warwick, to overpower Somerset and have him arrested. With one swift move, Margaret and her bestie are kicked out of court. She's isolated from power and without a doubt, desperate to keep control of the country. But Margaret is not stupid, and she drafts the Bill of Five Articles in an effort to protect Prince Edward's rights during Henry's illness. In January 1454, she asked Parliament for the regency of her son. She never saw anything weird about this. In fact, her mother did similar things in Anjou, but that was a duchy, and this is the entire country. The nobles were not having it. The idea of being ruled by a French girl was absolutely outlandish. The Duke of York gains what he wanted, being the protector of England, and so far, he was doing a good job. Margaret's luck is on her side once again when Henry wakes up on Christmas 1454, having regained his senses. This is a win for her, so she cannot kick out the Duke of York, and Somerset is back on the king's side. The Duke of York was prepared for conflict and began marching south to meet the Lancastrian army. His aim was simple, kill Somerset and take control of Henry. But Somerset had the king with him. Despite Henry not being able to fight, this was a little old move. Whoever had the king had the power. The negotiations went nowhere and the Earl of Warwick makes the first move in the Little War of the Roses. They captured the king and secured him in the abbey. The Duke of York is only missing Somerset who is captured and killed. But he's by far the only noble to die in this slaughter. Lord Clifford and the Earl of Northumberland are also killed. Margaret and the Duke of York are now in a full-blown war. Whether both of them believe they know what they're doing, there is no way back from the First Battle of St. Albans. Henry agrees to make York and his friends the advisors. But the nobles are not happy with York, and according to the Brute Chronicles, it's Margaret who's wearing the pants in the kingdom. And so far, she's once again doing a good job. But their mutual hatred is such that it's screwing things over. York is granted conditional forgiveness, and a love day procession was celebrated, in which the king walked alone to St. Paul's Cathedral, where Margaret and York walked, holding hands. It is most likely that Henry insisted on this, 
as he really did not want to go to war. Acting in the name of her son and husband, hostilities are back again in 1459 at the Battle of Poor Health. The fifth Baron Audley was defeated by, by Richard Neville, Earl of Salisbury, from the Yorkist army. Richard, Duke of York, fled England, and Margaret realized he should have killed him if she wanted to hold control. She stripped him of his lands and titles, but once Warwick gave him a major victory again, York arrives back again, sword drawn, and orders the nobles to crown him, saying both he and Henry are descendants of Edward III. Parliament is thrown into anarchy, knowing that siding with either man is going to throw the country into anarchy. Two weeks later, Parliament makes a decision, and they choose Richard Duke of York. He doesn't get the crown though, but he has been crowned Lord Protector once again, and Henry's heir. For Margaret, this was an absolute shit show. This man, her son, was not in the line of succession anymore, and she heads to Wales and Scotland. One of her servants robbed her and even threatened to kill the prince, but she was able to escape and managed to make her way to Jasper Tudor at Harley Castle, where she and her son were welcomed. Her principal commander was Henry Beaufort, 3rd Duke of Somerset, and he gained a major victory for her at the Battle of Wakefield on 1460. The Earl of Salisbury and Richard Duke of York were killed and their heads displayed on the gates of the city of York. Margaret had won, but it is necessary to say that she did not issue these executions. By this point, Henry was barely clinging to power, and it was Margaret the one who did everything she could to rule England. Despite still being at the top, Margaret knew the House of York could come back, and they did. Richard, Duke of York, had a few sons, and the next one in line was Edward, Earl of March, who looked at Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, as a mentor. Warwick had a famous nickname, the Kingmaker, and he was defeated by Margaret at the Second Battle of St. Albans, and for this one, she was present. She recaptured her husband and ordered the execution of two Yorkist prisoners of war. They had kept watch over the king when he was prisoner, but the king promised them immunity. However, it was she the one who ordered their executions. The Lancaster victories did not last long, and they were brutally beaten at the Battle of Tower Town on 1461 by Edward. Henry is forced to flee to Scotland with Margaret and their son. Edward of York was just 18 years old, and he had an imposing figure at 6'3 with muscular build. He was taller than the average medieval man and definitely worked for publicity. He had now become Edward IV and had effectively beaten Queen Margaret. She was in a precarious position, she had fled with her husband and son, but she was still a shield for France and would not give up easily in the face of defeat. She traveled to France and allied herself with her cousin, King Louis XI of France, but by this point Margaret was very much broke and went often without food. She retired to her father's estate where she lived on a scanty pension. She tried to get help from Louis, but he mocked her. By this point, Henry was captured in Lancashire. His feet were tied to stirrups of horses and he was escorted to London and kept in custody in the Tower of London for the next five years. Margaret's cousin, Louis, negotiated a truce with Edward IV in agreement to not support the Lancastrians. But as she planned her next move, she had an unexpected visitor. The man who once was her sworn enemy was sitting across her planning how to depose King Edward. Despite Warwick being Edward's greatest supporter, the relationship deteriorated when Edward married out of love to a widow named Elizabeth Woodville. Warwick was the feared kingmaker and had shed sweat, blood, and tears to put the House of York into power, and the fact that Edward made these type of decisions without him was like spatting at his face. Warwick defected to the Lancastrian cause, and as part of her condition, Margaret made Warwick beg on his knees for forgiveness. He married his daughter and Neville to Margaret's son Edward. 
over her strong objections in order to cement the alliance. Warwick returned to England, restoring Henry VI briefly to the throne. On October 3, 1470, Margaret, Edward and Anne were ready to follow him when their luck ran dry as the Earl was defeated and killed by the returning King Edward IV in the Battle of Barnet on April 1471. Margaret led her own army at the Battle of Chesterbury on the 4th of May 1471. 27 years to the exact date, she had agreed to marry Henry VI. This time her own son, 17-year-old Edward of Westminster, fought for his right to the throne. But the Lancastrian forces lost once again, and Edward of Westminster died. The circumstances of his death are murky. Some sources say he died in the battlefield, while others say he was executed by the Duke of Clarence after the fight. Throughout the years, Margaret has gained a reputation of rudeness and aggression, and become the power behind the throne, leading battles and making sure the Red Rose and her family remain powerful. However, after the repeated defeats and the death of her son, her spirit was broken. Edward's troops found Margaret and Anne Neville hiding in a house, and she was brought to London. Margaret was sent to the Wallingford Castle, and she was transferred to the Tower of London, where Henry VI had been imprisoned and later killed while he kneeled to pray on his private chapel. In 1472, her lady-in-waiting Alice Chaucer was given custody of the former queen. She was later ransomed by King Louis XI, and she lived hand-to-mouth in poverty at the mercy of the king until her death in August 25, 1482, in Anjou. Thank you for watching this video, and I'll see you next time.